people make this thing called money bad. And so most people don't have enough of it. They're stressed out, living a life and working a job they don't even like, they don't even love, around people they don't even like for that very thing, money. But then are mad at others if they seem to have more of it or how they get it seems to be a more enjoyable approach Then there's jealousy and envy and judgment. Those same people, if they somehow have a little breakthrough or start to fall into acquiring a little bit more, what happens? Immediately then they feel guilty. Brothers and sisters, we can't thank you enough for all your love, your support, and your faithfulness. It's been brought to my attention if you really want to do something to bless us, to thank us. Apparently, simply hitting the like button on YouTube would be more impactful than what I ever knew, let alone subscribing to us on YouTube if you're not already. And then over on Spotify and Apple, please leave us a review. All of your listening and your comments to us mean the world to us. Um, and do us a favor and just hit like on YouTube and leave us reviews on Spotify and Apple. And we're going to continue to serve you with our whole heart. Thank you so much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hip here coming to you with another edition of the Tattoo Guardians podcast. And today I'm accompanied with my co-defendant, Mr. Matt Clemmer. Uh, Josh is out taking a break, some well-needed rest. And we have another special guest, my Valentine. Part two, Mr. Ryan Roy. Hey! What up? Happy day! I'm back. <laughs> and I didn't ask you, I'm sorry, will you be my Valentine? I will. Awesome. Uh, no one has asked me yet, so you're the first come, first serve. You even got the red here. shirt on, boy! <laughs> it's a, it's oh, official. Oh my God. Ryan, we had such an outpouring of love and appreciation uh, for the last episode we had you on just two weeks ago. Um, rad awesome yeah. yeah i a lot of people reached out to me too and they're like oh man it was just resonated struck a chord and uh i'm so happy that uh that we can make that happen my god um today and i know we promised you all a part two um and so who knows where this conversation could lead because you know last time was ryan was on and he was giving us useful tangible tactical tools and steps uh not only how to deal with your finances, but even the perspective shifts that he gave us. I remember you saying, if you did anything, if you can at least help give us perspective shift and take the sting away, you know, um, and I feel like you did that well. And so we're going back here today for more. But Ryan and I, we all know that there's layers to this shit and what's under the surface of even what we do with our money and how we do it. Uh, and you touched on a little bit is our way of being around this thing called money. Um, yeah. And, you know, with my students, obviously, uh, you and I uh, serve the world and our industry together with our whole hearts, just helping people get freed up in a lot of those areas in their business. But a lot of those areas are their own stories and their limiting beliefs that they're caring about themselves that does aren't true, don't even serve them, um, but they may not even be aware. And, and I know you do a lot of this work with your people, really just help set people free so that they've actually got a true launch pad, a true clean slate today to create and operate from versus their life looking like a cover-up of a cover-up of a cover-up every day. Right. That's what I would say is uh, you can't put icing on a mud pie and have it taste good, right? My God. Yes. <laughs> uh, but today, brother, speaking I, speaking of stories, yeah, okay. I, I actually have I have a story about stories. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so this is this is probably the best place to start here. Okay, okay. so um, a few months ago, I um, so I follow this guy David Savage. I don't know if you're familiar or have heard of him. Mm. He to to describe what he does, you could call him like a professional empath, I guess. Mm. And I actually heard him first. He was on the Duncan Trussell Family Hour podcast, one of my absolute favorite podcasts yes. of all time. Yes. Um, Is David a and, uh, older gentleman, like a pepper hair shaved head, maybe like a little beard or goat? Not shaved head. No, uh, does have like a peppery hair. But I think he's. I think he he grayed out younger. Uh, okay. I think he's a little bit. He's like in his mid to late thirties, okay. early forties, maybe somewhere in that okay. range. 
Uh, hard to read guy, but really beautiful human being. And anyway, I'm on his newsletter and I like kind of never, you know, you sign up these newsletters and you never read them. And then I read one of them and it was like, Hey, I'm doing this retreat, um, uh, on money, on our relationship with money. And I was like, Oh, that sounds awesome. Like I'm, I'm interested, you know, like, uh, cause he works it, like with your emotions and has these really powerful ways of tapping into and, uh, you know, recreating your emotions back to you because what you can recreate will ultimately disappear. It doesn't have power over you anymore. Yeah. And anyway, so I'm like, oh, this is cool. I, I responded and um, he gets back to me. He's like, so the thing about this money retreat is that it's actually an ayahuasca ceremony. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and I, you know, uh, and I, I do like to kind of, when I do talk about these things, I, I like to be clear that like uh, I view ayahuasca as medicine. It, it is absolutely a, a healing um, medicine, just not prescribed by Western doctors, mm. you know? Um, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I, I don't put like, you know, it's just not something that works for me to do. But I have done a number of ayahuasca ceremonies over the past couple of years. And so I was like, wow, uh, an ayahuasca ceremony with the intention to heal not just the participants' relationship with money, but to heal the world's relationship with money. And I was like, sign me up. Mm. Let's do this. And so, uh, you know, you usually have, – have, have you ever done an ayahuasca ceremony, Matt? I haven't. And not sign me up, though. I'm doing another one in March. You should come. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's space in that one, but I, I do them every six months roughly, so maybe two a year, okay. um, give or take. Um, but th this was actually the first time doing a ceremony outside of the, the, the community that I normally do it with. Mm. Anyway – uh, this, the first night, usually the first night's gentle. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, the second night I, I was prepared for a bit more of an intense cause it, ayahuasca can be extremely intense and can be terrifying. It's challenging. It, it, you know, I, I view like drugs are a way to escape your emotions and your feelings. Ayahuasca puts it right up there, right in front of your face for you to deal with mm. in a way that you cannot escape it. Mm. And 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 then on the other side of that is liberation, mm. is freedom. Mm. And um, and I, I've done well over a dozen ceremonies at this point, and it, it, it's something that I, I feel like I've I, you learn to work with the medicine, I guess, yeah. over time, and so I'm much more comfortable with it. Anyway. I am in the second night and I'm not having a powerful experience. And this is actually something that this is like a repeating pattern in my life where I don't have the experience I think I'm supposed to be having. Come on. And then what I end up getting is exactly the experience that I needed to get. Mm. Have you ever had that happen? Fuck yes. Right? Yes. It's funny how life's like that. And so I, um, I'm not, I, I'm not in the medicine as they say, like there's times, there's times where you're deep in the chuma, you're passing through the veil of reality. in which case there is no question you are, you know, you're in the medicine. Yeah. And then there's times where you're just not, you're kind of just like grounded and in reality. And I was kind of finding myself more grounded and not. And I was like, Oh, maybe, you know, it's, uh, it kind of felt like I had a bad Wi-Fi signal or something. I just wasn't quite connecting. And, uh, and anyway, I, I eventually, uh, through the uh, sort of a Reiki energetic healing participation of one of the other members of the ceremony, I felt like my signal was boosted. And all of a sudden, I found myself like in not or sort of looking through the lens of like a microscope, maybe. It sort of felt like when the doctor puts one of those tubes down your nose and you look in the camera. Yeah. And uh, I felt like that all of a sudden my vision was this tube this cavern and i'm looking around and it's dark and i'm there's light and uh you know i'm like sort of shining a light on it and i realize in this place where i was or what i was looking at was the energetic sort of vein system i don't know some sort of like these tunnels where um I guess energy moves, right? Okay. And except that the the tunnels were caked on with tar on the sides and that was restricting the flow of energy. And now I always talk about money as this flow of energy and and I I don't know how it came and sometimes you get these <sighs> things you understand you don't necessarily understand through language, but yeah. I I came to understand that what I was uh, confronted with was 
the centuries of humanity's conversations around money, the stories around money that we have caked on to the walls of our energetic uh, mm. ventricle system, mm. something like that, right? Yeah. And I could peel away and pick away at these stories. They were caked on like layers, like paint, like an old apartment where the paint is caked on and you peel it off and you can see the different layers of, oh, this apartment used to be pink yeah. and blue and, you know. And it was like that. And I, I was uh, sort of devastated in that moment because I realized that we're never going to be able to heal the world's relationship with money. That we have so many stories on top of stories on top of stories that were told thousands of years ago about what money is and the way that we're supposed to relate to money and the whole idea of it that we're never going to be able to clean the slate like you were saying and get back to nothing right get back mm. to an empty clean slate so that we can truly create something that works for everyone for anyone and everyone with nothing and no one left out right mm. that's what i want i want a world where money works for everyone and anyone <laughs> with no one and nothing left out that's what i'm fighting for but to get there we have to get back to a clean slate and i was like well we're never going to do that and it was sad i was like and then I sort of think like, how do we, how do we solve this problem? Like I've dedicated my life to healing the world's relationship with money. That's my mission. And I know it's a big mission. I probably w might not accomplish it in my lifetime, but I want my lifetime to be about that mission. You oh, know? God. And, uh, and then I started to think of, okay, well, what if I got all these other healer financial coaches and spiritual healers and things and we team up and we do this together and yes we can you almost like doctors across borders yeah. like teaming up to work on a project right yeah and i was like sure and then i'll do it but it's still it's so big and then it was like uh sometimes in these ceremonies music has a big part to play in an ayahuasca ceremony and um uh jeff buckley's hallelujah came mm. on Jeff Buckley's version of Hallelujah. Mm. And I get tingles thinking about it because I was just struck with like, oh, right. The solution is grace. Mm. Is being open to and inviting grace mm. and things beyond our understanding. Mm. Uh, we think we know it all. I think I know it all, all the mm. time, but mm. I don't. And mm reminding myself that, oh i don't have all the answers i don't know where all the solutions are going to come from but something greater than myself beyond my comprehension and that i don't even know what i what i define grace as but mm. i do believe grace is beyond my comprehension and i just have to be open to receiving whatever it is for it to show up in whatever way it wants to show up and it's um and that's how we're going to heal the world's relationship with money so mm. that was that was the the conclusion that I got that I didn't think I was going to get out of that particular ceremony. And um, my God. So I just wanted to start the conversation there and just share that's, but it is the stories. Yeah. That's the source of the breakdown around money. It's not, it's not capitalism. It's not the government. It's not taxes. It's the story that we all have around money that is limiting yeah. what we're able to to do and the way that we can relate to money. And I see it all the time. You know, I'm talking to people about money and they're visibly, I'm on Zoom and they're visibly like as if they're being put in a cage or something, right? You know? Yeah. And they're not, but we're talking about money and their body language is like, ah, you mm -hmm. know? And mm -hmm. it's because of the story that they have. It's like <laughs> no one's shoving you into a cage right now. No, nothing's physically, what's so is we're just here having a conversation. But in yeah. your world, something's happening to you because we're talking about money, and it's because of the the stories and the layers of stories that you have. My God, yeah. I love that. And isn't it interesting? I don't know the ratio, but it seems like most people have money stories that aren't serving them at all, aren't good. Meaning, like, it doesn't even seem like half and half, half the world's got good stories around <laughs> money and half don't. It seems like most... <laughs> People have such shit stories around money to where those of us that are even trying to show up in the world with a different way of being around it, it's so foreign to others. And, of course, then we can get judged. People don't like us already for even entering the conversation or operating from a different place. Have you found that to be uh, 
in in your journey oh, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's not just like, oh, if you don't have money, you have a crap story about money. You could have millions of dollars and have a shit story about Ooh, money that is not serving you. So good. So, so it's cool. not about the amount because you could also have near to nothing saved, but have a great relationship with money. I think it is possible. And you yeah. know, I don't know what it would look like, but uh I I I think that ultimately it comes down to like how at ease and at peace and playful and curious can you be around money? Ooh. Because the more playful and curious I can be around money, the more free I am. You know, I, I think of my daughter, she's three years old, and she goes to sit down with some, she has these like magnetic blocks she's getting really into, and she builds all these things. And sometimes they fall down, and sometimes they get up, and, it, you know, and she's just playing, and she's curious, and she's exploring, and uh, she's free around those blocks, you know? She's uh -huh. not restricted by her stories around these blocks and i want to be that way around money and you know even realizing that stories are just a point of view because so many people are yeah. carrying their stories and they don't even realize it's just a point of view it's just a story that they could totally once identify completely let go of and create or take on a whole new story that actually is true and going to serve them um it's so wild how many people, myself included, walked around carrying stories that I just swore was truth or factual, only to find out that wasn't true or factual at all. That was just a fucking story I've been carrying since I was seven, right? <laughs> yeah, we, we, I mean, I can think back to like, you know, uh, talking to my dad about money. My dad grew up really poor and like, like they didn't always have shoes poor. And, uh, and he grew up in Maine. It was really cold. <laughs> and I can only imagine how, you know, that not having shoes up in Maine. But uh, so he but he did very well for himself. He's uh, sort of a philosopher. And um, my, my dad's a philosopher. My mom's an artist. So that had something to do with the way I turned out. Nice. Um, <laughs> and yeah. uh, but he ended up doing fairly well for himself, self-employed, uh, sort of a consulting business that he started. Um and I, I wanted something as a kid and I wanted a, like, I think it was a video game. It might've been a Pokemon game or something I wanted. And he was like, well, you know, we can't get that right now, but you know, maybe we can, we used to play these games where like I would either uh, get, you know, an A on my spelling test or get three grades in a row, some, some game. It was always it was a big part of my growing up. And, and I like to play games around money with my, you know, my, my course and, and in my life, um, and so I'd always play these games, but I remember thinking, man, when I grow up and I make money, psh, I'm just going to buy all that shit I want as soon as I fucking want it. Mm. And I decided that as a kid. And then when I grew up and I started to make money, that's exactly what I did. But it's interesting that I decided that as like an eight-year-old kid. Yeah. And I made that decision in that moment. Yeah. And then it dictated the way I did money until honestly, shit, it still dictates the way I do money sometimes. Yeah. Like it's still a powerfully, I just, I can remember the moment even. I remember my dad's face. I remember the situation when I made that decision. And, um, and I, I think for a lot of us, there's some moment that, we uh, were dealing with money or talking to a parent or, you know, it was early on um, that there was some interaction around money and we made some decision, fear-based decision or attack, right? In that moment, I made it like a very attachment-based decision. I was very like, I'm going to get, I'm attached to, I want things and I'm going to get things when I want them. Yeah. Um, and that worked up until the point that I realized that it wasn't really ever going to work for me and- mm. I realized if I wanted to have a retirement account and save to buy a house and have financial security, that was not going to work for me anymore. And I, I started to shift my perspective, you know? Oh, I love that. Mm. Yes. Yeah, and you mentioned that last uh, episode, that there are no should-haves. may have worked for you at one yeah. point in your life. And now if you grow or in your awareness and realize, hey, it's no longer serving me, and I can create something new, uh, more from being observer and noticing versus judge of my own self. Yeah, and and why a lot of educations out there 
don't really change people's lives and why I think, you know, your program and my program are really changing people's lives is because we're tapping into the story that you have mm. around your business, your life, yourself, my your self worth, your yes. um because it, it's like then you're getting to the root of it all. It's yeah. like you could take a financial course and we can teach you budgeting and systems and a retirement That's and how right. to buy a house and all this stuff. But if we don't talk about your emotional relationship with money, who you're being, Come on. what those conversations are so that we can identify them and see them. I always tell people like, I don't, it's not that I don't have crappy conversations, stories in my head around money. I still have them, yeah. but they're like this big yeah. and I see them and I wave at them yeah. and I'm like, Hey dude, I see you fear. I see you worry. Like, yeah. That's cool. It, it doesn't serve me, but you know, I appreciate your input mm. and thank you for sharing. Yeah. And uh, I'm gonna go with this other thought process. You know that. Oh, um, I love that. Like, this money, this dance, this flow of energy. I'm just dancing yeah. with the flow of energy in my life because I could worry about it or I could dance with it. My God. They're both lies. They're both made up stories. It's just which wow. which lie serves your life more. Wow. Well, and you mentioned it last time too. You remind us the the age old uh, that which you resist persists, right? Mm -hmm. But we've also realized if we embrace whatever we embrace, can dissolve, you know. Um, and I like that yeah. you notice whether lack uh, still shows up in your head, an old story that you let go of didn't serve you, but will still show up to revisit you. I love that you don't judge yourself; you just observe. And notice, like, oh, hey, I remember you. Like, return to sender. No thanks. I'm still not picking yeah. you back <laughs> up. But you're not kicking your own ass for even having the thoughts, right? Totally, yeah. I love that. You know, something we share with our students all the time starting out is how you see yourself in your business determines what's even possible for you. Now, we live in a world mm -hmm. of infinite possibility the uh, in, in, in abundance, well, why isn't it showing up in level 10 in, in everyone's life? And it's back to those stories. Because how you see yourself in your business is what determines what's possible for you. And to Ryan's point, that's why looking underneath at the stories you tell yourself, i.e. how you even see yourself in your business, is the creative process of what you are and what you aren't, what you can have and what you can't have because you say so. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I think the first the first step in all this, because we're we're diving into some heady stuff with all this, but the the first step is just being able to identify that conversation, that worry, that thought that doesn't serve you. Yeah. And even if you can write it out in a sentence like uh you know, I'm going to go broke or whatever the thought is for you. Um, mm. And uh, and then realize, one, it's not the truth. Yeah. And two, it's not even you that had that thought. Mm. You aren't the one. The thought happened, mm. but it's not like you, you didn't decide to think I'm going to go broke. You didn't wake up in the morning and be like, you know what? I'm going to think today. I'm going to. I'm going to think about going broke today. That's actually a really great way to spend my day. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. Yeah. Your ego might have, mm. your identity might have, you know, your fear-based, uh, individuated separateness mm. might have decided to have a fear-based thought about money. But you, as a whole uh, connected being, connected to everything and everyone around you, did not choose to have that thought. And so identify, and that's why I almost personified. I'm like, hey, little dude, little, like, it's like this thing outside of me. It's not me. I didn't have that fear-based thought. This other thing had it and whispered it into my brain. Mm. And uh, I acknowledge it. I appreciate it. I think, because here's the thing. It, it says what it says, all that fear-based stuff. It says what it says because it loves you. It wants you to survive. It doesn't necessarily want you to thrive, mm. but it definitely wants you to survive. Yeah. And its intentions are good. So it means well. Um, it just might not serve your greatest potential. That's all. Mm. You know, you'd brought up um, curious and playful with money. And there's a, a, a book that I've listened to uh, multiple times uh, that's really had an impact on me. And it's The Power of the Subconscious Mind. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I believe it was written like in the 50s and 60s, and it was a uh, basically like the science of of our minds and how powerful it is. And there's a, a part in it where the guy is talking about like abundance and it. And I'm not quoting this verbatim, but he basically said a man with an abundant mindset will thrive and prosper in any timeline or scenario. So like even now, if we were to go back to trading furs, like if your mindset is is with abundance, um, that you'll be prosperous even in situations like that. So oftentimes, like as I've, you know, because it wasn't until recent years that I started like really looking intimately at my personal relationship with money. Um, and I tried to carry that with me so much to the point that even when I finish my journal entries daily, I leave it saying, though day or night I am prospered in all my ways, I am abundantly wealthy and successful, I am abundantly healthy, those around me are abundantly healthy. Um, Mm -hmm. And I get, I'm pretty playful with my money, and I'm curious with it, and I realize that it's energy. If I hold the door open for you and smile to let you in to the grocery store before me, I just exchanged energy. Money's exactly the same. It's just something tangible with dead people on it that we give to each other. <laughs> um, and when times get scary and those little those little worries pop up, I can always remember that a man with an abundant mindset will always prosper. And then I wave to my little dude too. And then I think, because you know, you said something earlier on about people will have a lot of money. And Matt always says, and I think it's a Bob Marley quote, some people are so broke, all they have is money. Um, yeah. And it reminds me of like me and my brother are kind of polar opposites. Um, I remember when I used to do I used to do interior trim with him and, you know, I'm young. I'm just out of high school, so I'm blowing my cash. Monday rolls around. We're at McDonald's at the lunch line and he's got to loan me five dollars and thirty five cents for my my meal. And sure enough, when Friday would come around, he didn't want six bucks. He didn't want five bucks. He wanted five dollars and thirty five cents. Um, and he's yeah. very frugal. Now I know he's probably better off than I am. He's got a decade more than I do on life. Um, and he's been in the same career since he's been out of high school. He owns his own business, but he's like so frugal and it's almost, it's that lack mentality that I feel now I'm speaking on another man, but I'm just given my experience of how I remember my brother being where I, I am I may not be the greatest giver, but I like to get a little bit uh, of cash set up just to give it away, you know. Um, but also, yeah. I li- I like things too. So, like when you talked about curiosity and playful, um, like this level of of how I'm growing, maturing, you know what what I said earlier, what you inspired me to do this tax season um, is just like the old way of being is now changing. Um, and maturing and shifting into something different. So like I'm in a, I'm in a fear based area, but that's all right because I've been here before and all fear is, is fake evidence appearing real. Um, and I know that it's got me because I believe that it's got me because when I had doubts before and r- relied on that belief of I'm all right, there's, I've gotten grace multiple times and ain't nothing changed this time. As long as I keep living yeah. a spiritually practical centered life, um, it works out in my favor. It's always been working out in my favor. I'm just now no longer blind to see it. And then I also can receive it as well. But I just appreciate that. And um, I really related with like the the being curious um, and playful with money because because I am and I guess more so just just uh, letting you know that I can relate with that. And I'm just excited to see the possibilities of like when I can be even more curious and more playful with even more giant lump sums of money. Like I always tell people, man, my goal is to be so wealthy, right? I used to say rich, but I've replaced rich with wealthy because there's a big difference between those two categories that I want to like after this is over and Matt wants a Philadelphia cheesesteak, we just take a plane to Philly, get a cheesesteak. And while we're there waiting in line, we might see a a homeless family. And I just like, 
I buy them a house or hand them to the keys to the rental car that I, I'm using just to give away and be like, want nothing else other than to just, here you go, and then jump back on the plane and fly home. Um, the ability yeah. to do something like that is magnificent, you know, um, and that's being playful and curious with money. There is there is something you you mentioned uh, that you you journal pretty frequently. Yes. Um, how long have you been doing that? Uh, con- consecutively, three to four years, and then kind of off and on. I I've journaled. I uh, started journaling when I did the the Artist Way mm. book. Are you familiar with the Artist Way by Julia Cameron? Mm-mm. Um, it's a uh, it's a it's a book designed to help artists become unblocked creatively. But, you know, in the same way, like you said, energy is energy is energy is when you the same tools to unblock creatively, I find unblock you financially as well. Um, and a lot of her book is about becoming playful and creative uh, or playful and curious um, to evoke creativity. Um, and so part of that book's part of the exercise is doing these morning journal entries um, and uh, anyway, I, I was just going to say that, like, I think journaling, waking up in the morning, I like doing it first thing in the morning and I don't do it every morning. Sometimes I'll go months without journaling and then I'll journal for months. So my practice is a little bit irregular, but um, I truly think that it was and is because I take that time to write about just do a first do a brain dump sometimes there's just like mm. shit that just needs to come out that I can look at it differently when I'm writing it out versus uh, looking at it inside my brain. I'm looking at it with my brain from the outside. Um, but then to also get clear on what is the future that I'm manifesting, really uh, get those goals and that vision. Like you said, I'm, what am I doing? I'm flying to Philly. I'm treating this family. I'm being generous. Um, I, I think it's one of the most powerful tools you can use to create the life you want to live. Facts, man. There's there's something about taking it here and then bringing it tangible in front of you to where like I can't I can't show you my thoughts right now, but I can write them out on paper, fold them up and mail them to you. You know, it's something tangible. It's bringing it into this, I don't know, dimension, I guess. It's 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 literally manifesting it. So like in the, you know, thinking into results, Bob Proctor work, you know, they say everything was created twice. It was created in here and then it was created out here, you know. Um, but when you write it down, like that literally is taking the creation in here and then creating it out here. And then it evolves from there. But that's the 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 transfer from being an idea to being manifested into reality often starts with, uh, and that's why I like to journal with a real pen and physical paper mm-hmm. versus just typing it on my computer because I feel I'm truly, man, in that moment, magic is happening. I'm transferring the idea through my arm, through my hand, into the pen, and then the ink is staining the paper, and that idea is, that manifestation is now physical. Man, yeah, it, it sounds like we have a similar uh, morning meditation when it comes to that, you know, and I, I've journaled on and off throughout my whole life, um, more so in the recent last years, you know, and it spawned from a place of depression, um, which created something magical. And it's like, yeah. um, So yeah, even (laughs) let me ask you this, like, if you go, was there ever a process when like, you weren't staying consistent? Did you have to like, give yourself space and realize like, hey, I'm not a failure just because I didn't do this today. Then it it, with me, it did. And then I had to mature, like, I'm purposely not going to journal today. (laughs) <laughs> because I'm not a failure if I do or if I don't. This doesn't make me. And then now it's just more free and curious and playful. Yeah. So meditation and journaling are both things that I practice pretty regularly. Um, I've recently been meditating more than I've been journaling. And sometimes, especially with the family, it, it can feel difficult to get all those things in. Um, but actually, there's there's a good joke I heard that uh, a Buddhist is – either someone that meditates every day or someone that beats themselves up for not meditating every day. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, but, you know, at the end of the day, you you certainly don't want to use your lack of journaling Mm -hmm. as a thing to beat yourself over the head with. That's so counterproductive. It's just like, 
acknowledge it. Oh yeah, I started. You know, and that's why a lot of times people don't start something because they don't think they'll be consistent so that they never. And there are times where I just get one journal session in one day and I don't fucking journal for the next couple of weeks and then I'll hit one day. And then there are times where I just fall into a rhythm where it's every single day. Um, and I, it, I, I guess I give, I guess sometimes the reason I don't journal is like I have, I give myself, I convince myself that there are other things that I should be doing that will get my life to where I want it to be more quickly than spending five to 10 to 20 minutes journaling. Mm -hmm. But I actually don't think that's true. I don't, I don't really, if I'm really honest with myself, I really do believe that spending that 15 to 20 minutes journaling and that 15 to 20 minutes meditating and surrendering to the universe so that the universe can do what it wants to do. Cause me thinking that I know what's best is not, <laughs> not ever really worked out. Um, it's like I, I I sort of like those those two actions I feel have done more for me in my life and helped manifest not just what I want, but what I'm truly meant to create in my lifetime than any amount of hard focused work. And I'm really good at putting my head down and 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 you know, hustling and grinding it out. Like I'm really good at that. But I don't think I, I think I can hustle and grind it out till you know the dogs come home or whatever the hell they say and uh it wouldn't make a difference if i wasn't putting in that time to manifest create in my journal unload sometimes and then also surrender to the universe and just say you know what despite all my efforts i'm just going to invite you know the powers that created this crazy thing we call reality to um to influence my life um, and do things for me that I cannot do for myself. I couldn't agree more. Matt, how are you coming Man, with your journaling? Like, <laughs> Why do you ask? <laughs> I just, you know. It, <laughs> yeah, so for all our listeners that <clears throat> have been sitting here the past 10 minutes, like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> Can, for uh, all you tattoo guardians that don't journal, I guess you're we're fucked. Yeah, she can't do it. That's what I tell people. They when yeah. I when I meet with people, I'm like, look, either I can help you, and that's great, and we can talk about that, or you're fucked, yeah. and you should just walk off into the woods and die. Me hey, too. Me uh, too. To our <laughs> listeners, you guys can come on up. There's room with me and Ryan. There's yeah. plenty of room up here, ain't there, Ryan? Oh. Here's the thing. Here's the real thing. I looked back at my journal entries recently. And I was looking at some December, and and this, I'm saying this to show everyone that it is not too late and there is it is never too late yeah. it is never you could hear this and not journal for the next five years and then you could start journaling and you're going to produce incredible results if you are using it and you know maybe get some guidance around it because I, I don't know that i knew how to write about my life in a way that was powerful until i worked with uh some coaches that helped me but um i i was working with a coach in the bob proctor thinking into results course uh and I was writing December of 2021. So what is that? Just about uh, uh, two years ago, right? Yeah. Um, and I think I, and I was journaling and I was like, I I am earning, because I like to write in the I am present tense, right? You know, not the I want, because the I want will just continue to want. Right. Uh, I don't want to be the version of me that wants the thing. I want to be the version of me that is oh, the thing. Oh, come so on. So I am earning $30,000 a month. Yes. That's what I wanted. That's what I was creating in that moment in my journal. Yeah. And um and I said I'm earning uh $30,000 a month and I'm earning it by 2024. That was the goal that I had set for myself. And I wrote this over and over again. I had pages of it. I was looking through my journal recently and I was like, "Wow, I like, you know, I just filled it because that was what I was told to do in this course and I was like I'm writing it out and I'm like this is fucking crazy I don't know what the fuck this is going to do yeah. but I'm going to do it because this is what my coach told me to do yeah. and um, I think that was two years ago I think and I said it for 2024 I think I hit that mark you know in less than two years from writing that out mm. it's beautiful and it was and I didn't even realize it when I hit that mark yeah. but I you know I set this income goal 
And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And that was the thing. It's like, so in, in the thinking results, they talk about A type goals, B type goals, and C type goals. Mm. So A type goals are things that you know how to do and you know you can do. And you set a goal, you say, I'm going to go, I don't know, brush my teeth or, yeah. or I'm going to go make a hundred dollars on a tattoo, right? You might already know how to do that. Yeah. And that's your goal. And you set it. B type goals are things you think you can do based on the past. So past uh, experiences have led me to believe that there's a good chance that I could do X, Y, Z. That's a B type goal. Okay. Now a C type goal is a goal that you have no fucking clue how to do yeah. that you really want. Yeah. And that kind of scares you. Yeah. And for me setting that income goal of $30,000 a month, that was a C type goal. I, I don't have any fucking clue how I'm going to do this. Yeah. There's no, you know, at the time I was making maybe eight to 12 grand a month. I was like, I, you know, but I'm going to write this out and I'm going to trust the universe is going to show me and deliver me whatever resources and people and experience and knowledge and wisdom that I need to create this and make this happen. And, and in way less than the time that I thought it was going to take, uh, that became my reality. Would you say it's safe to say that in that moment you made a decision? Well, it depends on which definition of decision we're talking I about. I know it. And the only reason why is because, <laughs> And I know you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know. Ah. A decision to actually well, hey, write it let down me put it to you or like a this, decision to... Put it, yeah. this, this hit me and stung a little and I hurt so good. But someone said it like this. Goals are for people who can't make decisions. Goals are for people who can't make decisions. Yeah, and so I, I was like, like that. Ouch. And in that, so in that use of the word decision, yeah, yeah, I made a fucking decision. Yes, you did. It wasn't. Yes, you it did. wasn't going any other That's way. That's right. That's right. This is the way it's fucking going. That's right. I don't have any clue how it's going to go right. that way. And I'm not going to put the goal 10 years out because that's just too vague. Mm, yeah. I'm going to put it, I put it like three years out. Yeah. I was like that, that I don't, that feels a little scary, a little intimidating. Mm. Even to just admit it to myself. Like when I first admitted that I want to earn a million dollars a year. In fact, my, my income goal right now is $2.8 million a year. Come on, That's Ryan. where I want to be. Oh, yes. And I came up with 2.8 because I literally did the math and I was like, okay, if I were to live a, an extraordinary life beyond my wildest dreams where I'm a massive contribution to the world around me and the people in my life, how much would that cost per year? And net the after writing it all out and doing it, and it took me actually a couple hours to do this, I did the math, I estimated it, and the, the net income was 2.8 million. Um but it felt weird to say that. It feels weird to say, I, I want to be a millionaire. Like, I don't, and that, again, why does it feel weird? Well, because there's stories in the world that make me think that's a weird thing to admit and acknowledge. But oh, what's, yes. what's wrong with saying that I want to be, a, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, now if I want to be a millionaire so that I can like do some horrific shit, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but then, it, then it's the, not the fact that I want to be a millionaire right. That is the skanky part of it, you know. Man. It's the, the what am I going to do with it? But I want to, I want to change the world, yeah, you know, for the, for the better. I want my daughter to live into a world where people are more free around money. My That's what I want. And Man, speaking of money stories, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just listening to that and going back to your ayahuasca story about money. Um, yeah, and the stories that are placed on it. And when I heard you say that, I share the same, and. Um, then it's like not only the stories that are programmed in me through society, but also the projected stories of what people may think if they find out that I want to be a millionaire. Who am I? Yeah. Who the fuck are you? I'm on a podcast right now telling <laughs> the tattoo industry that I want to be and a millionaire. Just probably like, oh, lost shit. How dare you? Ten minutes ago, whoever <laughs> liked Ryan <laughs> don't like him now. <laughs> right? But has Ryan changed who he is? No. Right? But if all of a sudden your yeah. opinion about who you think Ryan is has changed because he spout out some numbers, his own personal decision mm. tells us more about you and where you're at, not Ryan and where he's going. Well, and I'm, you know, the type of person that I heard you say 2.8 and I'm always into friendly competition. So I'm like, well, I'm going to get 2.9 every every year. <laughs> Do it. Get it. Hey, let's everybody. I want you to be me. On. Hey, let's go. Game on, man. Game on. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, man. See, back when you was hanging All out. All right, by when? Hip, hip, by when? Ooh. I'm going to give myself three years and I'm going to journal this tomorrow. All right, By three, three years, three years we're going to be multimillionaires each year. All right. 
I love it. Let's game on. Let's do it in three years. Love it. See, this is a fun game. Back when you were hanging around. Can't, the, the, the best part about this game is we can't lose. It, you, Come on. You actually can't. Because God forbid we only make 1.8. Man. <laughs> Speaking of, it's all about... Oh, who, that sucks. Who, right. <laughs> Life is hard. I can't work under these conditions. Hey, who you associate <laughs> with, though? I remember back in the days, you was kicking it with a crowd that was, like, trying to come up with a 40, <laughs> trying to get 50 for that, you know, bag or something. Like, man, I'll see. I got five on it, right? Like, you, you know, but just by your circle, who you're hanging out with today, it just cost you to raise your own levels. And, and the thing is, is I can say that and look dead into this camera, knowing that I'm speaking to an entire world of an audience of our listeners, which already is a blessing. And they probably don't like you anymore either now. And, and that's fine because <laughs> I can genuinely and honestly say that and not have fear around it because I know that it's 100% possible. It's more than possible. And it's been possible the whole time, even when there was fear attached for, to it. But mm. it's like, that's... That's 100% a possibility. So do you, are you making a decision right now? I am. My God. Not only is it possible, and here's the thing. So when I started posting about financial stuff on my, on my tattoo Instagram, I was like, I immediately started losing all these followers. <laughs> <laughs> People were like, who the fuck is this guy yeah. talking about money, man? Yeah. Leave me the fuck alone. Mm. And I was like, ah, oh, this is stupid. But I was like, you know what? I, I really can't give any fucks about what any of these people think. And if you don't want to see it, then you should unfollow me. Yeah. And then I would get a message from someone that would say, hey, Ryan, thank you so much for sharing this information. There's no way yeah. I was ever going to learn this or find this and hearing you and talking about it, you know. And that one message, I don't care if a thousand people stop following me on Instagram, that one message made all the difference in the world. So for everyone that stopped listening at the minute we started talking about wanting to be millionaires, mm. there's someone who's still listening. Come on. Who is for in their moment right now deciding for themselves that they want a life of unlimited abundance so that mm. they can make a positive impact on the world around them. Mm. And I would rather have everyone drop off this podcast mm. and have that impact on one person mm. than not speak my truth, hide it, just to make everyone feel more comfortable. Come on, Ryan. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, we really don't like that guy now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I love you anyway. Yeah. I do. Yes, Baba. Oh, thank you. I wasn't gonna bring this up, but but Matt, were you were you drunk texting me last night? <laughs> <laughs> no. Matt was like, Matt texted me like ten o'clock. He's like, I love you, brother. Yeah, and that and was, I was like for, just randomly out of nowhere. And that was no, <laughs> that was just meant for you because you're on my heart, and I knew we were gonna have this meeting today, and I was just having a love attack, and I was like, I'm not gonna wait till tomorrow to oh. tell him I think I'm thankful for him. I'm gonna fucking tell him right now. The reason why I, I thought you asked those because immediately after I texted you a love text, then I sent one to my wife, but I accidentally sent it to you. And okay, then, I saw, and, I saw, it. and then undid it. I was like, yo, I that immediately can't be thought, for me. Oh, Ryan's not even gonna receive my first message. He probably think I'm fucking. Yeah, it was back for somebody else. <laughs> so what was this message like? So well, I, just, I, yeah. I, so I get a message from Matt right at ten, twelve at night. He said, "I love you, brother." I was like, I love you too, dude. I'm so stoked for tomorrow. Mm. And then I get another message that says, I love you, my queen. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, and then it was immediately unsent, <laughs> which I didn't even know you could unsend it. I was like, I was like, either Matt is a little tipsy <laughs> or he's trying to come out to me or he meant to text his yep. wife. Option Probably three. that one. <laughs> That's right. Oh my God. That's exactly how That's it so happened. Funny. But I love that love attack. You know what? Uh, I've gotten love attacks from people in TBM <laughs> because you you told them, you said, hey, if you are thinking of someone and you appreciate them, yeah. why don't you just let them know right That's now? It. Why are you going to wait to let them know? And I've gotten love attacks from people mm. from your program because mm. they know me and they just reached out and they're like, hey, Ryan, I just want to let you know how much I... I was like, oh, shit. Mike. Like That made my whole fucking day. Dude. So thank you for teaching people. Yes to let it rip yeah. and uh, acknowledge the love that they have for people in their life. Oh, so good. Oh, <laughs> man. Speaking on changing the world, we all just step yeah. in the power of acknowledgement, man. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Yes, because we all need to hear it, you know. 
And I always say, if you think something good about somebody, say it. We all need to hear it. Or act on it, because we all need to hear it. And when I say act on it, it may mean to go to that person, let them know. Or it may mean to not say anything to that person and to pray for them on their behalf, to de- mm-hmm. make p- declarations and speak life into their life. Whatever, when you're an open vessel, when you're open, you'll get called upon and your own authority will be used on behalf of others just because. Yeah. That's, that's, acknowledgement is generosity. It's extreme generosity. Mm. And the beautiful part of it is you know, you can be generous with your money, but you do have to give some money over and it will be returned to you in other ways, shapes and forms yeah. in your life. I, yeah. I promise you. Yeah. Uh, but when you're acknowledging someone, it's just like a candle lighting another candle. There's mm-hmm. no loss of flame. Mm-hmm. And you get to be generous and giving mm-hmm. to someone and they get to be receiving and supported. Yeah. And there's no loss of energy. It's kind of miraculous <sighs> yeah. when you think about it. It really, really is. The impact is huge. And we never even fully know the impact. Just know that you have one. And then we try not to be attached to the outcome. Mm -hmm. But in the times where we get to see a little fruit, oh, it's good to get to see. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's fun to trust the process knowing I may never see the fruit of this. And that's okay, too. I'm honored I got to be a vessel in this moment in time, in this person's life. That alone, what an honor, you know. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's crazy because three of us, I forgot for a minute that we're tattoo artists. I forget that sometimes. Right, wait, (laughs) were we supposed to talk about tattoos? (laughs) No, but whether it's... We're just human beings, being human beings here together. You know, but speaking of like... Just across the board, money stories and, and tattoo artists, probably people that heat you up, maybe inquiring on your services or thinking about joining TBM. Well, guess what? TBM costs money to join. That alone will, will some people fall off. I thought you guys really wanted to help. <laughs> You're charging, right? <laughs> um, like, yeah. And it's weird because people, I we always say this, especially artists, but human beings have, well, you know, and Ryan, you probably know this better than, any of us have a poor emotional connection in a way of being around this thing called money and all these money stories. Most people make this thing called money bad. And so most people don't have enough of it. They're stressed out, living a life and working a job they don't even like, they don't even love, around people they don't even like for that very thing, money. But then are mad at others if they seem to have more of it or how they get it seems to be a more enjoyable approach, then there's jealousy and envy and judgment. Those same people, if they somehow have a little breakthrough or start to fall into acquiring a little bit more, what happens? Immediately then they feel guilty. Almost like damned if they do, mm-hmm. damned if they don't. They mm-hmm. can't have enough, but if they figure out a way to get some, now they feel guilt and shame around that that keeps them stifled and blocked. And these are where a lot of artists are when we first meet them. Or self-worth is low. Uh, they can't even put proper value on themselves, let alone raise their rates and be empowered enough to um, you know, effortlessly convey that to clients. And so there's layers of money stories that we have to Layers, deal with artists yeah. the second they enter TBM. Now we chisel them off and do perception, uh, perspective shifts all the way through and limiting beliefs and chains fall off of them all yeah. along the way. But it is a journey, my friends. But those that even can get to that point are the ones that are open enough to even if they can't let their stories go to set it aside for maybe just maybe a glimmer of hope of another possibility. Yeah. You know, um, but do you run into a lot in, in, of those common stories in how do you help people uh, overcome them? Yeah, uh, that is, uh, you know, I, I see it a lot in, uh, in just in tattooing where people are like, oh, so and so charges 500 an hour. Mm-hmm. How could they possibly do yeah. that? You know, and at the end of the day, I say like, First of all, I don't, I don't care if they charge 500. I don't care if they charge 5,000 an right. hour. But how is it, what's the conversation over there with you? Come on, Ryan. That's impacting you. Yes. 
And what is what is the impact on your life that you can't even allow someone else to mm. open up and receive abundance, right? How does that impact you opening yourself up Come on. to receiving abundance? Ooh. And so let's get let's get right down to that. Yeah. And and the judgment and the, all that stuff is right. It's really just shining a light on a relationship that you have yourself with your own self-worth. And, it, and it's not bad. It's not right. It's not wrong. Yes. I'm not saying this to point something it, out. And then, yes. again, don't use any of this to beat yourself over the head yes. with. Um, just our, our, here's the deal. When I realized that my resentments towards others and my judgments towards others were really just a mirror reflecting me back at God me. On, damn. Woo. Then... I could use them powerfully to create in the world. So your resentments and your judgments, they serve a purpose. Yeah. They just don't serve the purpose you think Come they serve. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> They're extremely valuable. Yeah. And they are a mirror reflecting you back at you. And if you can see that every time you have a judgment at someone else or you think something or a jealousy. By the way, jealousy is one of the biggest ways that you can block the flow Come of on. abundance and energy into your life is being jealous of another person's success mm. or situation. Mm. Um, and then use that and, and then use that as a tool to look and say, Oh wow, I'm, I'm jealous. Well, what, what is the conversation? What's the story over here? Uh, is it that that person doesn't deserve? Well, if they don't deserve, then I don't deserve. And is there, you know, what is it? But we'll get down to mm. it, get curious mm. Um, and you'll find that, oh yeah, there's either a, a off, you know, most of us human beings, we have some conversation of I'm not enough. Mm. I don't feel like I'm enough. Yes. Uh, and so then our jealousy and our judgments of others are actually just reflecting back that conversation that we believe that we are inherently not enough. My God. And as long as you believe that you are inherently not enough, you will never have enough right, ever, right. no matter how much you get. Right. Yep. And so then you want to turn that conversation, like we said earlier, with the fear and the worry of realizing, oh, I see that jealousy is really just this little monster, yeah. this little dude, this little creature, yeah. right? It doesn't have to be a monster. It could just be a creature. Identify I mean, like, oh, that's that conversation. And it's keeping me from playing big games in my life. Mm. Man, that little guy, he's really, now I can see him, he's just like a little gremlin, that jealous gremlin. I'm going to call gremlin. him Jelly. I must feel bad for him. I just want to, <laughs> Jelly, I just want to pet him on the head, oh, you feed little him little jelly. peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> My God. And another thing, Ryan, that a lot of people, especially artists, is they turn this thing called money into a morality th issue. And it's mm. so ironic because some of the most Immoral tattooers we know, like, charge less than us. And so since we charge more, they say we're, like, immoral for our rates, mm. even though we're walking in love and kindness and service to the world. These other guys, like, just because their price is as much as us, they, like, consider us not moral dudes and they're, like, the moral ones. And it blows my fucking mind that that's even the lens that they are viewing the whole world through. You know, um, because it's not a morality thing. Ryan even touched on that earlier. You know, money is just a tool. It's energy. It's who you are being with the tools and what you're doing with yeah. them out of who you are being, you know. But either way, I ain't mad at you because it has no bearing on who I am, what I'm called to, the decisions I'm making. Pricing is such a good yeah. and loaded topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. I mean, it's such people get every time I posted something the other day about Pricing your tattoos and hourly rate, and it, it, most people were really supportive, but they get a couple people they could just get triggered by the conversation, and that's okay. Uh, but let's use that. Let's try and you know what's what's there. And you know when I started charging, I remember what, the highest I started charging for tattoos was two eighty an hour, and now I had friends that charge a lot more than that. But for me, that was like a lot yeah. to charge. And um, but for me to charge two eighty an hour, and this is for anything, mm -hmm. and it might not be the case, but I don't relate to my clients like you're going to think I charge too much. Mm. Uh-uh. 
that's not I don't look at you when I when you talk to me about getting tattooed. I'm not relating to you like I'm about to tell you my prices and you're going to think I charge too much. I the way I relate to you is that I'm going to present my prices and you're going to see my prices as an opportunity to get quality work that inspires you and that you're going to love for the rest of your life. That's it. Yep. Love it. Ooh. Those are my prices. That's when I present my prices, it presents <clears throat> itself as an opportunity to you and you are excited when I present my prices because you know that I'm taking myself uh, to a certain level of, you know, not yeah. to say if you charge less, you don't take yourself seriously, yeah. but it does communicate to some degree like a confidence that I have, like you're going to be blown away by the result yeah. that you get. And I know that. Yeah. And so I have no fear about that. So I have no fear charging yeah. this rate. Yeah. Um, now look, and then every time I say that someone says, yeah, but I saw someone charge $2,000 for a piece of crap and it healed like garbage. I'm like, yeah, are there people that do that? Sure. And I would imagine that at some point they either have to get better at tattooing or they have to lower their prices. Cause yeah. I don't think you can, I don't think the law mm. of, uh, yeah. economy or commerce is going to allow you to keep producing an inferior product yeah. and keep charging a superior premium price. Yeah. You know, yeah, it always weeds itself out. Yeah. You know, it, it's, yeah. and I totally agree with what you're saying. Like, are there similarities between a Ford Focus and an AMG G Wagon? There totally are. They can both get you to A and B, but ultimately, like you're paying for the quality. Um, and if you want more anonymities and um, shock and awe, you know, uh, yeah, people are gonna gonna appreciate like your uh, ma. Uh, oh fuck. Oh. Your your ordinary tattoo, yeah, they'll see that you have a tattoo. I'm full of ordinary tattoos for the most part, but I've got some fucking extraordinary tattoos too that were well worth every penny and every sacrifice I went and invested in them and wouldn't trade them for, for the world. And I'm a big fan of wanting to see the ugly foot in people. Um, so even the masters that tattooed <coughs> me, I'll ask them like things that they ain't happy with with my tattoo. Um, one of them, mm. you know, I traveled and got tattooed and it went up on the individual's Instagram for like an hour and they messaged me because they weren't happy with what it looked like and they wanted to do a second session. Wow. And I fucking love that. And that alone, just that experience built so much value for me because it's genuine, it's authentic, it's authentic, and it shows me because I can relate wait, you're a fucking master, you're world renowned and you have the same problem I have. Oh, okay. Well, fuck. Yeah. So where you're at, I can be there too. And I appreciated yeah. that. Yeah. I had a friend when I early on, a, a really close friend of mine, um, we, we were tatter tots together in the West village and, um, uh, Rachel Howard, she's a remarkable tattoo artist. Um, and, uh, I was talking to her about raising prices and she said uh, she was working at uh, East River Tattoo for most of her career in, in Brooklyn at Greenpoint. And she said when she raised her prices, I think she went from like 280 all the way to 350 an hour, like in one fell swoop. And she said she was a little nervous at first um, just because it was a big jump, but she knew that the demand for her work was there. And she said that clients were more appreciative of their work because they were paying more, like they respected her time, yep. the experience more. They were like, it, it was this kind of miraculous thing. As if it was more know? valuable. And she said, as if it was more valuable. And they actually weirdly got more value mm -hmm. out of it because they paid more. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's kind of strange when you think about it. And look, I'm not saying that it's the truth. You can certainly argue all kinds of ways, but I think for... For me, I mean, I, yeah, I, when I invest in something, whether that's a tattoo or a course or a electronic or a piece of clothing, like when I pay more for it, I do value it more. You know, I take it a little bit more seriously. I pay more and I pay more attention. And yep. that's, you know, been my experience. Now, is that always the case? Now, I've taken courses like the Landmark Forum. I think it's things 800 bucks. I probably got more value out of that course than almost any other mm. program I've ever taken. Yeah. But uh, so is it a rule that think? No, it's not. But it's been my experience more often than not. You know? Absolutely. And this is a big thing we work with on uh, in TV and with our students is helping them create and define who they are and how they operate. 
period, and how they create and move in the world and attract the right people that they're meant to serve to them simultaneously. You know what's so scary about that, though? What's that? What's so scary about that is the more you define who you are for yourself, yeah. the more you're going to rub other other people are going to get rubbed the wrong way. But it's not because of what you are doing or you're saying. Right. It's because your authenticity yeah. is threatening to their inauthenticity. Come on, brother. And in that transition or growth for a lot of our students, it can be painful because some people mm-hmm. are now only down with an expired version of them. <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah, your friends are only down to hang out with an expired version of yes. you. And and that's a sad, that can be a very sad place to be in your life, but it's ultimately, Ooh. you know, with no mud, no lotus. That's like right. It's probably one of the most beautiful places. And, I, and that happened to me when I was 26. I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs. And I realized that like 90% of my friends were just my friends because we got wasted together. Yeah. And I dropped them. Yeah. I just dropped them. Yeah. And it was a weird time for me. Yeah. And, uh, and you know what? I have a much smaller circle of close friends these days. Mm, yeah. But man, I mean, I would do anything for them. And and, and likewise, you know, yes. where we trust each other. We love each other. We talk to each other regularly, you know. And even when we don't, when we come back together, you know, it's that connection is is deep. And it's not because of some antiquated version. And as I evolve and as they evolve, we still we grow together, sure. you know. Mm hmm. It's better to have four quarters than a hundred pennies. <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> it depends. It's the same. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. For friends, it's better to have four quarters than a hundred pennies. <laughs> Whatever, hip. <laughs> Money. <laughs> I know it. Agreed. Damn it, Ryan. I, you know, all of uh, TBM the students love you. All the guardians now love you. Uh, people in the backgrounds already approaching me, trying to figure out how you and I can work and serve this industry together. Mm-hmm. And I was letting them know, Ryan and I have already had those talks ourselves. We're living into the same question ourselves. <laughs> We're living into the same question. Yes. Yeah. And, and oh man, I feel so grateful to, to be sharing this space with the two of you. Yes. Like, yes, brother. what, uh, what a life I've never in a million years. Uh, th- these past couple years for me have been pretty, pretty challenging yeah. uh but also like equally extraordinary and mm, mm. uh that's that's the beauty of life you know it uh, is and dude i just want to acknowledge yeah, you and commend you for all the work that you not only do and are doing but that you've done on yourself and taken 1000 percent responsibility with yourself and to take real looks in the mirror at you and to take all your power back and and, and not Blaming anyone or anything. Uh, And I honor the 26-year-old version of you who made a decision to get clean and to let go of all his friends. And every iteration of you going through pain and growing pains and through seasons of your garden being weeded. uh, and, and, And I just honor you and I thank you for taking responsibility to be the best version of you that you can be. Uh... In our worlds have collided, you know, I, I, I'm honored that I know you, that I got to meet you. My garden got weeded. I found myself uh, in a different state sitting at a dinner table with you and Russ Abbott. You know, yeah, it was a magical, magical dinner. Right. Just the three of them. Kobe beef. (laughs) My God. And if you wouldn't have done the work that you were called to do, and if I wouldn't have, neither of us would have been at that table or on this call right now. So thank you. Yeah. You know how I describe you, Matt, when I tell people about you? I just say, Matt, you know, he's just a unicorn of a human being. That's what I say. My God. You're just a magical unicorn of a human <laughs> being. That's the I literally said that about you like a dozen times to be like, <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I love oh. you, my queen. <laughs> I will see that. I love you, my queen. <laughs> <laughs> 
Happy man. day. All right. Love you, Ryan Roy. Thanks for being. I love both of you. Oh, I you love too, you all. Yes. I love all the listeners. Yes. Uh, and uh, I can't wait. I I need I need to start a podcast too. I need because I want to have more conversations about money yeah. with uh, more people yeah. and more more of these strange types of conversations, <laughs> free, open, curious, creative conversations around money. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, that will be happening. Good. I'll just throw a little plug out okay. for that, and uh, I'll have to invite you yes. on, uh, and we'll just keep keep the conversation going. My God, Brian, beautiful. Is there one last thing you want to share with the Guardians before we go? One last thing. Um, just uh, if you just take a moment to just think about how can I give grace to someone else in their life today Mm. just that little moment even just taking the moment to question that Mm. is Mm. so powerful and i think that's what it's going to take so in this moment how can i make grace available for another person another human being another creature another animal whatever it is Mm. but to to give grace and allow grace to show up in the world around you that's all thank you ryan roy Thank you, Guardians. We'll see you next week. Man, what time is it? 12.14 a.m. Matt, I don't know about you, but I like coffee. You know I do. Every day, all day. Man, and I could go for one right now. So our mm-hmm. listeners, did you know that you can buy us a coffee? For real? Yeah. Well, Why gotta, would they do that? Well, if you like what we do and you support our show and you appreciate our content, you can just go and click that little button that our producer Mike puts in every show and buy us a coffee just to show your contribution that you appreciate what we do for you to you help for us real? out. People t- can really buy us a coffee. Totally. I would be honored if you bought me a coffee. And not only that, but we got a little spot. It's special for uh, the VIP listeners. It's called Close Friends on Instagram. And on there, you can see some behind-the-scenes content. And when the cameras ain't running, seeing all the shit, we'd be talking about each other. (laughs) Is that true, Mike? Damn, you guys. This is the first I've heard about either of these. So they can buy you or me a coffee. Or Mr. Carlton. Or Mr. Carlton. And, like get a sneak peek behind the scenes yeah by doing what again fucking smashing that button (laughs) okay (laughs) what button you talking about i want to smash the button it's the fucking the button on the fucking thing (laughs) okay (laughs) (laughs) do it just do it (laughs) absolutely demolish the button But thanks for your time again, and we appreciate all our listeners. Always.